if you have mismanaged stress or if your nervous system is spending too much time in that sympathetic fight or flight mode and you aren't able to recalibrate back into regulatory parasympathetic space, that that will drive chronic illness. Um, and so my whole kind of Achilles heel of stress is the Achilles heel of wellness. Uh, if we don't manage our stress, we will see leaky gut, we will see dysbiosis, we will see nutrient deficiency, we will see chronic inflammation, we will see hormone imbalance, adrenal insufficiency, thyroid dysfunction, blood sugar irregularities, and it goes on. Uh, and so I really realized this after 10 years of clinical work where I was working all these protocols, but we weren't harnessing the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, and, and I think that again, the gift that we want to give future generations as women is the ability to identify stress, uh, and then have some tools to be able to shift back into that regulatory mode so we can transmute that stress response versus to suppress it and actually create positive energy out of it or action plan, uh, et cetera. I'm excited for you all to listen to this episode with Allie Miller. Allie is a registered dietitian with a naturopathic background and a contagious passion for using nutrients and food as the foundation of treatment protocols. She's the author of the international bestseller, The Anti-Anxiety Diet and The Anti-Anxiety Diet Cookbook. Her food as medicine philosophy is supported by up-to-date scientific research for a functional integrative approach to healing the body. Her passion is to create public awareness and access to functional medicine approaches, protocols, and supplement formulas to enhance whole body health to optimize and thrive, not just survive. All right, Allie, finally, long time no see. The last time we were together was at the uh, Regenerative Farming Conference out by you. Um, so it's so good to see you. And I'm really been like, I've really been looking forward to this podcast. So thanks for being here. I'm excited to be here. Yes, it was lovely meeting you. And I'm happy to go a little deeper dive today. I know. Let's do it. So for those people that don't know you, you know, I've introduced you for the podcast, but you wrote the anti-anxiety diet and you're a functional medicine practitioner. You see clients. And um, can you tell us like a little bit about your background and how you personally have found wellness over the years? Sure. So I went to a naturopathic college of medicine, Bastyr University, and that really helped me to set up a career that had a leg on each bank of the river, if you will, because instead of going the ND naturopathic doctor route, I went the RD route. So I have this ability to still coordinate care with the allopathic, which is the fancy word for your conventional medical doctors. So endocrinologists for hormone management and diabetes as a certified diabetes educator or working with gastroenterologists uh, with elimination diets and gut restoration. And then I still have a really deeply rooted, guided by nature uh, and scientific discovery background. So I use food as medicine as the foundation of all of my protocols. And then I use targeted supplement support because I really believe very strongly that the biochemistry of the body demands different nutrients for enzyme pathways for activation. And if we work with nutrients first, we can not only manage symptoms of deficiency, but we can also upstream prevent many symptoms from actually even presenting in the first place. So I work with clients in a very individualized approach. When I was in medical school, I myself came down, and this is the classic story, right? <laughs> uh, with an autoimmune condition of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And at that time, I was a vegan. I was very convinced that the raw vegan diet was so high in antioxidants and this was necessary. And this was before a lot of the information came out on anti-nutrient. And I found very quickly a rapid swoop of transition guided by Weston A. Price Foundation and more ancestral approaches of eating of the importance of getting animal products back into my diet. And since then have been very passionate about snout to tail, honoring the whole animal, eating locally, and really being a part of the relationship with your farmers and ranchers. If you're going to use food as medicine, you have to have a solid pharmacy. Uh, so that's a big part of the passion of my clinic as well and the work that I do. And I think it's a fun fact that you live on a large piece of land and yeah, yeah. You your own animals and you have fruit trees and all kinds of this goodness. So yes, yes. you're not only uh, talking the talk, you're walking the walk, which is awesome. And it's a humbling process. <laughs> Girl, <laughs> it's everyday rinse and repeat of learning curves. But yes, we're on just under 15 acres out here in the hill country in Texas and 
We have a 40,000 gallon uh, rain barrel collection tank for our own private water system in our property. And then a secondary well, we have chickens and yeah, we have an orchard that we've been, like I said, humbly (laughs) working towards not failing every quarter. (laughs) Yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, let's dive into a little bit of your expertise. I think it does come from personal trials and tribulations where you want to keep yourself and you go deep into the research. So you mentioned a few things, anti-nutrients and then understanding the nutrient density of animal-based products. Can you talk me through a little bit of what you learned personally and what you've been able to share with your clients um, in your practice? Sure. And I love opening this with the concept. One of my favorite mantras that I use in the book is doctrine creates disconnect. So I say this uh, when I open the conversation that has a really dynamic potential for myopic tunnel vision approach (laughs) Uh, because everything is nuanced and there are seasons where we will tolerate things better. uh, And there are times that we need a little bit of hormesis or a little bit of a stress to actually provoke the body to make antioxidant. But then there are times when we're so stressed and maybe our gut is so destroyed that the anti-nutrients can actually do more harm than good. And so what anti-nutrients are basically is compounds in plants that can either inhibit nutrient absorption, so directly block the ability to absorb a nutrient in the gut, or they can have compounds that drive gut inflammation, like lectins, for instance. And I think that we've seen in the world of functional medicine and the deep dive that we've gone into with leaky gut, which basically I know your listeners are familiar with, but just full circle, uh, leaky gut is a process of damage to the villi, the microvilli of the epithelial tissue that lines our gut. And uh, we can have damage to that gut lining from stress alone, from chlorine in our tap water, from use of oral birth control, and of course, from inflammatory foods. And so for individuals that are under high mental emotional stress and have signs of leaky gut, They may need to hold off on all grains for sure, uh, because that's where a lot of the lectin content would be. And they might want to be strategic on actually holding off on other foods that have anti-nutrients in the process of healing. And so in the world of something like broccoli, which often gets demonized, uh, there definitely are goitrogens or compounds that can interfere with thyroid function. Uh, So for someone that maybe is dealing with a Hashimoto's thyroiditis flare, they definitely would not want to eat raw broccoli they could likely tolerate moderate to small amounts of roasted or steamed broccoli, and they most certainly could benefit from broccoli sprout. Uh, So there's always kind of a continuum based on the individual. And I like to say that because I think there's a big movement especially in the male uh, health world of carnivore. And I have used a carnivore approach when I'm doing a inflammatory bowel disease patient healing protocol for about a six week window, if you will, which starts with bone broth and proteins because we want to repair the tissue. Uh, But over time, I want my patients to have more flexibility and to actually provoke that hormesis because that broccoli, some will call it a toxin. Um, We see in human research study that when we consume this food, our body produces more endogenous glutathione, or we actually make more of the highest antioxidant compound that's capable to produce in the body. And this has been shown to reduce all-cause mortality, basically death, right? Uh, And so for me, just like a stressor of heat therapy or a stressor of lifting a weight through training, eating that broccoli is creating this hormesis that in an individual that has resilience and can tolerate that will create benefit. But again, there are some unique scenarios like myself when I was dealing with eating vital wheat gluten Uh, and soy as my primary proteins as a vegan, I had a pretty rough gut scenario. Uh, And so I needed to really recalibrate. I love that you set the stage that it's a continuum and you have to know where you are on that continuum. I think a lot of people, and especially women today who are overachievers and they have work aspirations and then they have their family and then they have their personal goals and we're carrying a lot of load to to take a minute and say like, what does my body need and what can it handle? And does it need that excess amount of food stress or does that calming nutrient dense protein? Is there a space for it? And and what can we handle? It's like, it's interesting because people do want to go to extremes. They want to go to the extreme of carnivore. They want to go to the extreme of raw vegan. And and again, um, depending on on where you're at, that could be quite stressful. And especially become doctrine or dogma with it, right? And your belief is so strong. That's why I say doctrine creates disconnect because it's like, 
we can just shut down the feedback that our body's trying to tell us. And it could be the canary in the coal mine of first having an anxiety attack, which was my case, um, and then could follow with hair falling out and could follow with skin flares. And the whole time we're saying, well, this is the perfect diet. Just get, get with it, body. Get back on track. Follow what this influencer is telling me is the right way versus really checking in and honing in on what I need today or what I need in this season. Uh, it could be based on hormone fluctuation for fertility. It could be based on hormone fluctuation based on a stress of a career shift, based on a move. There's so many reasons that we need to be adaptable. Uh, and I think a lot of the power of food freedom comes with a deep intuition of understanding what your body needs and understanding how to create tools to adjust and tweak. Absolutely. Well, diving into your research for your book, The Anti-Anxiety Diet, I'd love for you to talk about your anxiety attack, what that felt like, how we know we're having one, and then how we can understand uh, the HPA axis and how to eat to calm anxiety. Yeah, so, I mean... I want yes. <laughs> a continuum of you because I think it's so interesting and really profound where you are today and what you're teaching because it's so needed, especially in 2024. Like looking at the last four years, ooh, it's been a lot for everyone. So to normalize that and then to understand how to, to work through it. Yes. And I think our ability as mothers and as women to learn to harness our nervous system is one of the greatest gifts that we can do for our household and extend to our children. Uh, because we know that our nervous systems have a contagion. <laughs> we all know it. You know, <laughs> like if mom's bitey, all the kids know and the trickle, or if the kids are able to push our buttons and work our nervous system against us, that has a domino effect. Uh, and so I think for so many generations, Women suppressed the signs of survival. And that's where we look at things like the body keeps score and trauma and locking in the body. And I think the biggest assignment that I've been super passionate about in the last four years is taking the work of the anti-anxiety diet, which came out in 2017. And, you know, was really about my, my, I guess, hypothesis is that if you have mismanaged stress, so maybe you don't label it as anxiety because it doesn't have to be deemed as anxiety as a condition. Um, but if you have mismanaged stress or if your nervous system is spending too much time in that sympathetic fight or flight mode and you aren't able to recalibrate back into regulatory parasympathetic space, that that will drive chronic illness. Um, and so my whole kind of Achilles heel of stress is the Achilles heel of wellness. Uh, if we don't manage our stress, we will see leaky gut. We will see dysbiosis. We will see nutrient deficiency. We will see chronic inflammation. We will see hormone imbalance, adrenal insufficiency, thyroid dysfunction, blood sugar irregularities, and it goes on. Uh, and so I really realized this after 10 years of clinical work where I was working all these protocols, but we weren't harnessing the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, and, and I think that, again, the gift that we want to give future generations as women is the ability to identify stress. Uh, and then have some tools to be able to shift back into that regulatory mode so we can transmute that stress response versus to suppress it and actually create positive energy out of it or action plan, uh, et cetera. I love that so much. So how do we identify when we're dysregulated or when we're in that fight or flight mode? Yeah. So some of the classic symptoms that we'll see is dryness in the mouth, changes in heart rate, so regular heart rate or a racing heart rate, shortness of breath, or just not taking the time to exhale completely. Uh, we can see micro tremors, like shakiness in the nervous system, which can actually manifest in an actual small tremor or tick, or uh, we can have eye twitches, for instance, as a neuromuscular response. We can see changes in digestion. So like the enteric nervous system, which is basically the brain and the gut, corresponds so deeply with our central nervous system. And some people will call it like butterflies in their belly or their nerves. And that's the enteric nervous system having more parasympathetic or excuse me, more peristalsis or more pumping in response to that fight or flight surge where others will go locked and have more constipation during times of stress. Uh, we can see bloating in the abdomen, not related to bacterial imbalance, but related to stress and cortisol shifts. Uh, we can see insomnia, and then we can, of course, see racing in uh, the brain. So we can see rumination of overthinking things that have occurred or anticipatory stresses of the what if. Uh, and this can all drive that wild stallion in the brain to perpetuate that fight or flight uh, response in the body. 
Okay. So we're having these experiences real time. So I'm like going through it right now. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm doing a podcast with Ali. I'm feeling like sweaty and kind of like shaky. How can I process without suppressing that stress in a positive way to move forward and also not allow that stress to be kind of regurgitated to my family? Yeah. Like you said, yeah, no it's like this un, um, I mean, it's this unspoken truth that like, if the mom is calm and has, Chris calls it, he'll either say like, I need the mothership or the mother load. And that means that he's at a stress level of like a nine or a 10. He has a fuse of like nothing. He's going, he's feeling very agitated by our kids. And if I'm running around doing stuff, he just needs me to go sit on the playroom floor and be calm and play with the kids because he have a step back and kind of like either what we call chip, which means like go around the house and chip at things like clean up. Okay. Things, build things out. Yeah. Have a minute. Right. Uh-huh. So it's true though. Like he, like we've identified that in real time that if I'm running around doing stuff, it makes him more stressed out. And if he's super stressed, he needs me to sit, like actually physically be on the ground with our kids to calm them and to yes. calm the house. Just like yes. a lot of responsibility for the mom <laughs> to but hold that. <laughs> yeah. You know, so even more important that we're able to have mm. these tools. So I guess, yes. how the heck do we do that? <laughs> yes. So there are things that you can do preventatively or, you know, pro vigilantly, and then there's reactive elements, right? So first like foundations, some really important things to do is to separate yourself as much as you can from technology and EMF. Uh, because that is not your electromagnetic field. And especially when we pull in something that is rapid dopamine depleting, like social media or anything in, that can become a scroll hole, that jacks, that hijacks our nervous system, literally. Uh, and so when we know if we're feeling a little more bitey, a little more anxious, what we have to do is shut off and uh, be pretty fierce about protecting our own nervous system so that that's not polluting or hijacking from what we have. Uh, I would also suggest not wearing at the times of higher stress, like a Fitbit or something that has a tiny computer connected to your body. <laughs> this would be a good reason to, you know, keep the low radiation phone, uh, holders, if you will, keep them plugged in the kitchen, not in the bedroom, so that at least when you're sleeping, you can kind of reset your nervous system and not have that activation going. Gazing at the sunrise and sunset, this is the most powerful source of red light uh, that God can provide for us. And that is huge for melatonin and cortisol regulation and also can help us to feel safe. Uh, as also stargazing can be really lovely when you feel small and something very large and it almost takes your vagus nervous system where you go almost vasovagal, like getting dizzy, just staring up at the stars and things look so big or wonder over a valley or a canyon does that same vagal response for the body. At the home, we can incorporate doing some vibration, like bouncing, like I'm on a yoga ball right now. And any time that we're like, huh, 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 or going low and big, I'm um, like pounding on our heels, for instance, if we're standing to kind of throw the energy down. Um, I'll work with clients to actually cut, <laughs> like chopping in the air and to go. <laughs> um, that shushing actually has a very liberating response and a very grounding feeling in the nervous system. Breath work is incredible. Uh, I use in the anti-anxiety diet, Dr. Andrew Wiles 478 breath, mm -hmm. which is sealing your lips, and it's the most well-researched breath work out there. So I'll walk you guys through it because it's a powerful free tool. Um, you seal your lips and you inhale for a count of four. You hold that breath for the count of seven. And then for the eight count, which is a two to one ratio of inhale to exhale, you exhale and you envision like an inner tube that's been filled with air. It's a whooshing, a shh, compression type of exhale. We should maybe do it together for listeners so they can like experience it. But but what you'll notice is there actually has been shown in research that uh, we do see more GABA production during that time. Our vagus nerve actually, which is our autonomic nervous system highway and runs from the brainstem to the colon, has been shown in literature in three to four cycles of doing 478 that it goes parasympathetic. So your heart rate will change. You'll get an immediate almost kind of recalibration, at least after you do it two to three times. So we could do it once for listeners, then they can pause it and practice it maybe after. But I find that to be a really powerful tool. And I'll have people do this like when they're in their car transitioning to work. 
or when they're parking their car at home, transitioning to parenting, because we want to leave all that there and not allow that cortisol to just continue to surge and then another stressor. And so our body's just in this chaos survival mode. Um, so doing the four, seven, eight as a transition tool is extremely powerful. And you're just putting that harness back on your stress response in that sense. So maybe we walk through it. So yeah, yeah. let's do let's try it. one of these four, seven, eight breaths. Yeah. And then we'll dive into the HPA access and the vagus cool. nerve and, and the difference between a parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Okay, great. I just welcome everyone to kind of put your feet flat on the floor. Yeah, I like to shake out. <laughs> and then um, we're going to seal our lips. So we're going to breathe in for four. We're going to hold for seven. And we're going to whoosh. And then at that time, you'd go back in. And so that, but that shushing, it is when you think about like you go to a spa and it never says inhale, it says exhale. <laughs> and when we're in that survival mode, we tend to rapid breathe or shallow breathe or hold. Uh, and that exhale tells the body it's safe because when you're running from a cheetah, you're not exhaling. You're, <gasps> you're sipping at air, right? Um, or gulping at air, <laughs> maybe not as we're recommended to do. Uh, and so that exhale is extremely powerful. Oh, I love it. I mean, this right here, as a mom, I'm thinking about all the ways that I could help my kids with this too. I really, mm-hmm. you know, love to think holistically about my family. Like I yes. just had big boys off at school today and they were excited. They had to bring their Valentine's today for the parties later on this week. And it's just like, there was a lot of excitement. And just to be able to like pull into a parking spot before school and be like, okay, guys, let's do our, like, we always call it bear breaths, but take it a step further Mm -hmm. and do this counting with them and maybe do three rounds and then say, okay, have a great day. Like completely different way to send them into the, into the classroom to learn. And a tool that like, if we do it enough, will become automatic for them and something that they can use the rest of their life. Like, I think I just, we, we hold so much power and the ability to create space for our families and for ourselves. And, oh, Allie, I'm taking this Mm -hmm. one with me. Okay. I love it. And you know, also with littles, um, so like you said, bear breath, we do lion, the <sighs> exhale, and we love doing uh, feathers on the floor and watching their breath move the feather across the floor. Just understanding the power of how they have the ability to harness with just their breath alone um, and knowing what their breath feels like with holding their hands on their bellies and, you know, filling and releasing. And then the uh, balls, those like from like science centers, we call them breathing balls, but you know, they kind of expand and, and collapse. Those work really well too with kiddos. I mean, starting with toddler and on. I love that. Such good stuff. I'll put links to those in the show notes from today. Okay. All right. So let's jump into the HPA access, what it is um, so that people have the 101 here. Okay. So this is the feedback system of our autonomic nervous system. And your autonomic nervous system is the involuntary part of your nervous system that is going to pilot between sympathetic, which is the fight or flight response that we learned about in school, and parasympathetic, which in school we were told was rest and digest. But as I unpack the HPA axis, you'll learn that it is actually your everything regulatory. So it includes hormone regulation, it includes metabolic function, it includes sleep cycles and body temperature, not just how you digest foods by any means. Uh, and so your HPA axis is your hypothalamus and pituitary that are in the brain and how they respond to your tiny adrenal glands that sit above the kidney. And if we go through each organ, the hypothalamus and pituitary during a sympathetic fight or flight surge have the ability to stimulate the adrenals. And uh, if we pilot too much in that sympathetic nervous system space, we will have a disservice in other gland function. And so for instance, the hypothalamus is the regulator of the body. You know, when we talk about homeostasis or how the body finds balance after time of infection or during time of stress or any physiological change, the hypothalamus is really that primary regulator in the brain. It'll regulate your circadian rhythm, uh, so your sleep and wake cycles. It will regulate your satiety, uh, so your hunger or cravings will be impacted in the hypothalamus. Uh, It will impact your growth hormone production. 
your thyroid releasing hormone is regulated in the hypothalamus. And again, so growth hormone is your sexual reproductive hormones. Your uh, thyroid releasing hormone is what's going to then tell the pituitary to put out the thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH as we're familiar with in, you know, common thyroid panels. But again, if it's just putting out the corticotropin releasing hormone or the compound to stimulate the adrenals, all of the rest of that kind of goes to the wayside. And then in the pituitary, if the pituitary is in a survival mode, it's just making ACTH to tell the adrenals to make cortisol. And in that sense, we might get also aldosterone to crash. Aldosterone is another uh, steroid made by our adrenal glands that regulates sodium retention. So actually, that's something in the mainstream medical field that we work on with hypertension. But we'll also notice that if we're under high stress, that we might crave salt uh, because that aldosterone is actually reduced during times of stress. And so we're going to need to consume more salt to support our intracellular fluid or basically how our cells function. Uh, and we know that that's really necessary during time of high stress. Uh, we know that the pituitary, when it's in a regulatory mode, actually makes our uh, prolactin and oxytocin. So they can play a role, of course, with breastfeeding health, but so much further. Oxytocin is the bliss reward seeking. Oxytocin is that safe connection. And um, it's just released during orgasm and hugs and human contact. And so oxytocin is a natural anxiety reducing antidepressant. And that is suppressed during a stress response, but upregulated if we're in that parasympathetic mode. Uh, we make our follicular stimulating hormone and our luteal hormone. So our FSH and our LH, if we're looking at fertility and how our menstrual cycle functions. So under chronic stress, we can see infertility, we can see amenorrhea or loss of menstrual cycle. Uh, we can see the body putting out too much DHEA, which is another adrenal steroid hormone. This can convert to testosterone and estrogen favorably, or uh, it can also drive a fight or flight surge. Um, I liken DHEA to like a rubber band. Um, you want the perfect amount of a snap, so that you're good at gaining muscle tone and you have good stem cell function in the brain because DHEA is totally a metabolic miracle. Uh, but you don't want so much DHEA that you feel like Incredible Hulk and like you're going to chest bump someone in a parking lot. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and you definitely don't want such little DHEA that you're like a rubber band that's lost its snap and you're like apathetic and flat and under motivated and stressors just totally overburden you. Uh, and so there's a really sweet spot in the world of DHEA and cortisol. And those can definitely be thrown off by the HPA axis as well. Okay. So in separating kind of our master regulator, rest and digest as we were taught as kids versus that fight or flight, when you think about having a fight or flight moment and having those adrenals respond with cortisol, mm -hmm. that can happen to all of us. Is there anything or what are your recommendations for? processing that cortisol in an effective way without causing chronic issues. Right. Because if cortisol is constantly stimulated, this will actually interfere with muscle health. This will actually drive more belly fat. This will drive and perpetuate the anxiety and stress, the insomnia, and of course can interfere with energy uh, throughout the day. Right. So when we're looking at, you know, really getting in there and harnessing that fight or flight response, one of the things we want to do is acknowledge when we have times of stress, how to practice things like the 478 breath or uh, how to take things like bioidentical GABA at times of stress or maybe up our L-theanine, which is a nutrient that keeps us in an alpha brainwave mode without agitation and anxiety. I love L-theanine uh, as an amino acid. Uh, phosphatidylserine is a lovely amino acid that actually aids in metabolizing cortisol so that it doesn't stay stimulated and elevated in the body. I love nervines and adaptogens. Uh, so there's a formula in my supplement line called calm and clear. And that's like the ultimate parasympathetic harness, if you will, because uh, it has a blend of those amino acids, nervines, adaptogens, B vitamins, and um, pretty much all the regulating compounds. So we can nutritionally support ourselves if we know we're someone that's setting ourselves up for high stress. And then following that stressful event, we want to practice something that helps us to get back into that parasympathetic mode. And so it could be walking your kids to the beach. It could be in catching a sunset to kind of put back into the circuit board, right? It could be practicing um, shaking on the trampoline with the kids or having a dance party, uh, you know, as a shift. Definitely, we want to watch our nourishment and not allow fasting to be an additional stressor when we're under times of high stress. And I think that's the classic type A mama or woman, right? It's the 
undernourished and maybe not intentionally, maybe just too busy or lost their appetite or is doing a fasting protocol, over-exercising and over-caffeinated. Uh, and I think that when we kind of push, push, push the envelope, we have to just like a wardrobe in our closet. We have to think of our allostatic load to have swap outs and trade outs. And when we're really hot on, maybe it's plunging, maybe it's sauna, maybe it's something that feels really good to our body. Then we have to recognize where else are we going to release so that the, the bucket doesn't spill for that imbalanced stress response. Oh, I love that you're bringing this up because there are so many ways that we're stressing our body and, and, and much like the hormetic response of anything that we're doing, whether it's sauna, cold plunge, working out, like fasting, you name it, like all of these mm -hmm. kind of add and multiply and compound on themselves to create mm -hmm. stress experience of our body. So can we, can you explain how these are stressors to the body and Again, it's like that Goldilocks, right? Like what recommendations do you make to your patients when it comes to including these things, but not overdoing it? Right. And the problem is, girl, with the Goldilocks thing is like, well, sometimes you want a bigger bed to sleep in. <laughs> like, And that's okay. <laughs> so like Goldilocks doesn't have to always find a one size fit. Like sometimes during a season, you're going to want to push it and do a HIIT training and like really ring it out. And then there's other seasons when you should only be doing yoga or, you know, and not hot yoga at that, like a good yin flow. Uh, and, and so I think it is just kind of examining where we are again on what are the non-modifiable stressors that you're wearing today. So if you're going through a deep interpersonal stress response with a relationship of sorts, that's one that's going to hit pretty heavy in that HPA axis response. Uh, if you're going through mold toxicity, that's a physiological stressor to the body. Or if you know that you have a gut infection, that's a physiological stressor to the body. So not a time to amplify the selected stressors, right? Which would be like the temp changes, the exercise, the fasting. Uh, and so it's just kind of identifying, for me, I like to say, which are the hell yeahs? Like, which are the ones that like get you off and are the ones that you want because they make you feel vibrant and alive? And then what other ones are the stressors that you can do away with? Like, oh, I guess I don't need to fast. I suppose I could eat 30 grams of protein in the morning. <laughs> uh, you know, that's a welcome change. And I feel better, I've actually realized, because I'm not getting as much of that epinephrine adrenaline surge from my just coffee and collagen. I actually needed some more fat and nourishment in my nervous system. Then because of the hypothalamus getting the leptin response, says we're safe, we're satiated. So we're not in a survival response. Whereas if we calorie restrict and we just caffeinate, for some individuals it fits, but for some others that are going through dynamic stressors, that's not going to be the appropriate choice. I would say this speaks to my soul, just being that like this third postpartum has been such a drastic difference for me only in like what I've done is what I always have done. It's like, I love, right? or I love protein, fat, fiber, and greens. I love I do love my coffee with collagen or a protein source. I do love, you know, I love my workouts. I love my hot yoga. And the reality is three back-to-back -back pregnancies and breastfeeding for as long as I have 18 to 22 months, depending on the child we're talking about. Yes. And then rolling kind of into this postpartum phase of my third. And it's the stuff I did before just at that postnatal depletion and all of those years, plus like running the business and buying the house and renovating, like it just, my body wasn't going to handle that. And the only thing yeah. I, and with this, you know, with sleep deprivation of like a couple month old is the thing that I, the only thing I told myself this postpartum was loads of red meat, loads of liver, loads of organ meat, and starting your day with, I'm sometimes at 40 to 50 grams of protein in there. And it's happening within an hour and 90 minutes of waking up. And it's just like, yeah. and it was, it's been drastically different. Like the hair loss isn't happening. Like the breakage of nails isn't happening. And I know that the normal hormone fluctuations are happening in my body. But I mean, when I look back at being postpartum with Sebastian and with Tashin, the amount of hair breakage, the amount of like dry skin and just feeling like, a shell of myself. I just thought, oh, this is this is what everyone says is normal. So this is right. how I feel. And the reality was, is I was throwing myself back into work. I was over caffeinating. I was mm -hmm. eating as I like breakfast, but I wasn't. I wasn't eating like an athlete, which is like when you are a mom yep. and breastfeeding and not sleeping, like you are expending more energy and than an athlete. Yes. So no I was like, I would, I just applaud that because I think we, 
we all just get to this place where you're just depleted. And then that Mm -hmm. is a space in which all of the anxiety, the stress, the rumination just doubles and triples on top of itself. (laughs) No doubt. And like you said, we, we normalize the mediocrity of it. And unfortunately, I think that this is where a lot of individuals get gridlocked. And I put this quote in the Anti-Anxiety Diet Cookbook. Uh, and they, they got a little pushback from the publishers. But I, I love this phrase of from mediocrity to shitty is a very simple vacillation. Like going back and forth between shitty to mediocre because you don't know what good feels like. But yeah. once you've achieved optimal and you experience that and you tap in with that and you feel confident with what pillars are essential to keep you there, there's no way that you're going to allow yourself to fall back to shitty. <laughs> and yeah. So I think when people are eating processed foods, it's like, oh, well, that doesn't affect me. That doesn't affect me because they're in that mediocrity to shitty back and forth tag um, game of tennis. And so it really takes for sure. And I always say this with food freedom because I'm a big proponent of really food freedom and having the ability to eat what loves your body back and, you know, really be in tune with what works for your body. But you can't get there before you actually recalibrate and kind of wring out the the fuzzy gray noise. Yeah. You have to be able to say no to even the things that feel Mm -hmm. like their personal growth or, you know, whether you're like, I'm going to try and grow my business or I'm going to try and get stronger or I'm going to try and be better or I'm going to eat. Like you have to pick, prioritize Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. get really good at something to see changes in your, in your life or it all kind of falls apart. Yeah. The, the proverbial balancing of the hats, right. Or I always say like the getting dragged by the bumper of the vehicle of your body (laughs) throughout your life. Versus like getting back in the driver's seat at the wheel. And it takes a lot of editing. It takes a lot of ruthless editing to get there for sure. And and so important. Uh Uh-huh. Well, you are the expert in anti-anxiety and that's the life that I want to live. That's what I, you know, I want for my children. And it takes more than just deciding you're not going to have anxiety. It takes being able to process all of those cortisol hits and all of those Mm -hmm. stressors with um, with lifestyle interventions, but also it takes food. And you've written the anti-anxiety um, diet book and also the cookbook. So can we talk a little bit about how food plays a role and feeding plays a role in yeah. like, serving up your best self, so to speak? Yes. So the book takes this six R approach because alliteration is fun uh, of looking I at damn <laughs> right. I know List, alliterations give me all the things that help my brain remember. Let's do the all of the let's R's. Do the R thing. Yeah. Here we go. Yes. So you know each of the six R's has a different nutritional component with it, and I really wrote the book because there's not a progression that will fit everyone the same. Uh, and so as I unpack the R's, there's going to be some listeners that are like, "Ooh, that one's me," or "Ooh, I got to start there." So the first R we open with is to remove inflammation from the diet, um, remove inflammation from the body or inflammatory foods. And so in that chapter, I walk through the top five inflammatory foods, where they're found, swap out, and start to talk about how when CRP or a marker of inflammation is elevated, that we see more mental health issues, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, manic depressive disorder, disorder, excuse me, Uh, we see inflammation in the brain, essentially. And so when we can up our anti-inflammatory nutrients in that approach and eliminate the pro-inflammatory compounds, that can help to start addressing that inflammation. The second R is to Stop for a second. Uh-huh. What are I'm gonna st- we're gonna give some people the nuggets. What yes. are what can they start doing right now? What are these five foods that we can pull to decrease the the vast load of inflammation coming from food? Yes. So we're looking at in this approach, corn, soy, gluten, dairy, and refined sugar. Uh, And we talk about the dairy and gluten connection because of the casein and the gliadin. And there's a gluteomorphin or caseomorphin compound, which basically means that our opioid receptors in our brain respond unfavorably to the compounds in dairy and in gluten. Uh, I do introduce you with how to reintroduce these. And dairy is the one that I'm the biggest proponent of for mamas, especially because I see calcium deficiency, which is coming as another R. Uh, (laughs) Calcium deficiency can drive anxiety. And actually, because we're growing bones and breastfeeding, 
so many postpartum mamas need calcium. Uh, and so that's the first one that I recommend retesting with fermented forms of dairy and A2, which has a different casein in there. And that's a whole different conversation. But basically, removing inflammatory foods um, is the big, big R there. Um, and then the second R is to reset the microbiome. And so in this chapter, I give you a quiz on dysbiosis. We discuss, are you dealing with a bacteria infection in your gut? Uh, if you have an overgrowth of bad bacteria or candida in the body, what's wild is the enteric nervous system tells the body that it's in a survival mode. And so we actually make more epinephrine or adrenaline in response to the fact that we have an infection or an imbalance in our gut bacteria. And what's worse with that is when we're in an imbalanced microbiome, we don't manufacture as many landing gear neurotransmitters. So our serotonin and our GABA are actually made by our lactobacillus and our bifido strains of good gut flora. So if we have dysbiosis, that's an issue because that's driving actually an anxiety surge. If we have sterility in the gut, which we've seen in studies, that separation from parents they've done, they've done studies on um, a stress response with electroshock, and they see stress driving sterility in the microbiome. And that's why we say probiotics are nature's Prozac. Um, there's actually been studies with the lacto and bifido blend against fluoxetine uh, or Prozac, um, literally looking at same beneficial improvement in mood score without the GI side effects um, and actually seeing GI improvements. So pretty cool thing we can do in our household for sure is starting to add in probiotic rich foods to all household members to support that serotonin and GABA. And if a household member doesn't tolerate probiotics, then we have to start to kind of lift our eyebrow and explore if we need to do some form of a gut cleanse. Yeah. So powerful. So that in itself is huge. And honestly, gut infection is a huge driver of panic attack. I have so many men clients that are like, I'm not stressed, but I don't know why I'm, I'm short of breath and I'm having a, a really severe elephant on my chest. And it's like, well, because your gut biome is, is literally telling the body that it's not safe. Uh, so really powerful there. And then the third R is to repair the gut lining. So this is where we enter in things like bone broth. And we really talk about the brain gut access. Uh, the fourth R is to restore micronutrient deficiency. So this is where we tend to kind of hone in on like the postpartum world of, you know, nutrient depletion or vegetarians that might be deficient in B12 or iron and the role of some of these um, mood stabilizing minerals. So I really unpack things like magnesium and calcium and uh, MTHFR and methylated B vitamins and why that's important for some to consider. And then the fifth R is to rebound the adrenals. And that's where I enter in this HPA access stuff and a quiz on if you're stressed and wired or stressed and tired. So what side of the banks of the river are you on? And then the final R is to rebalance neurotransmitters. And in that chapter, it's very cool. I talk about eight different neurotransmitters. So dopamine, serotonin, GABA, um, glycine. And we actually look at um, these different neurotransmitters, what nutrients influence them, how you would express high or low. Uh, because for instance, too much serotonin, you're likely going to have diarrhea. Too little serotonin, you might be dealing with panic attack or depression. Uh, and so we have all these different ways of kind of understanding where, and then food as medicine of uh, nutrients. So for instance, tryptophan goes through 5-hydroxytryptophan to make serotonin and you need B6. And so we talk about uh, bone and skin on chicken thighs as a lovely source for that. Uh, and so it really connects the dots, hopefully, um, of when you hear, you know, and go through the progression. If someone has evacuated their house from a hurricane, they're maybe going into rebound adrenals chapter or just survived a really gnarly divorce. Maybe they're starting there. Whereas a new mama might start and restore their nutrient status and a teenager with acne might deal with the resetting of the microbiome. And hopefully I've given tools to help you understand, you know, what's the aha, this is me part about it. Oh, I mean, it's just a, it, it's like a guidebook, the way you can do yeah, yeah. your chapter, depending on what you're, what you're looking to support. Now, if someone, if, if a mama or dad or someone is listening and they want to do or bring in a couple things into their life and it kind of like the basics that would be a foundation for supporting their mood and and really eating an anti-anxiety diet sort of way what big recommendations do you think would be important for them to incorporate into their home and their life i mean i think the 
first one, which is introduced with the reduced inflammation within the constructs of sugar is blood sugar balance. Uh, and I know that we're both definitely same, same there. I mean, I think that if someone's having irregular blood sugar and they're eating naked carbs and aren't regulating the amount of carbs they're having from whole food sources and pairing those with proteins or fats, uh, and of course, if it's a whole food source, it's going to have fiber in it, uh, that that regulation of glycemic index of going from the roller coaster to the little speed bumps is a really dynamic response. And it's interesting, chicken and egg, just like with the microbiome, uh, you know, blood sugar dysglycemia can be also driven by stress, independent of diet. So the diet is how you can work to harness it. But I love sharing this antidote. I wore a CGM the first time ever, and I had lovely blood sugar, except for 4 p.m. And at 4 p.m., my blood sugar got up to 158 one time, 144 another time. And what it was is me closing clinic and my daughter at the time coming home from preschool. And it was the shame, I guess, or the guilt, the mom guilt. Again, interpersonal, nothing to do with actually like a clinical adrenaline response or performing. But it was literally the shifting of, oh man, Stella's going to be walking in the door. And when she says mama and comes to me, I can't be present because I have four patient charts in my brain that I have to download. And I would get a physiological surge, but I didn't know how impactful until I saw that CGM. Uh, and so now I actually adjusted my eating schedule where I have a classic three o'clock protein rich snack and I take GABA Calm, which is a bioidentical GABA at that time. And that has been game changed. Now my blood sugar doesn't vacillate and stays in the low 100s at that time. Um, and GABA is an inhibitory compound and it is just such a powerful gift <laughs> that our body makes. Uh, and so if you, my, my line, it's called GABA Calm. It's chewable. It's 10 to 15 minute onset. And it literally like vents the steam train buildup. Try that with your husband. Uh, the steam train venting of like when you're feeling the bottleneck response, it just, ha, huh, it, it, it dissipates that surge and it actually has a counter action on adrenaline. Uh, and so it can help us to feel safe. It can help to get us back into that parasympathetic mode. And um, I mean, it's just wild to see that, that blood sugar response from just loving my kid. <laughs> you know, nothing's wrong. Um, it's just, yeah. Right. But it's, I mean, we're, we're taught to hold everything together and to not have these mm -hmm. responses, but what's happening internally is we're experiencing it without experiencing it outward to the world, which is, I mean, I, I can tell you when wearing a CGM, I've had that same experience. Um, what I was wearing it when I was doing a news segment at one point and I'm like, mm -hmm. Oh, this. This is so fun. I'm on. And yeah. at certain points doing um like my coaching calls. And it's just like my body is gearing up for needing to be focused, needing to be mm -hmm. on. You feel the heart rate. And what you don't realize is that that is going to create, uh, that is going to free up stored sugar in your body, send mm -hmm. it into your bloodstream, drive your blood sugar up, and you're going to have that crash. So same like you, like the minute I get out of one of those speaking engagements or mm -hmm. where I feel that kind of stress and surge, I go directly to food to calm. Yeah. I, yep. I'm reaching for a protein shake. I'm reaching for whatever mm -hmm. leftover proteins are in my fridge. I'm calming myself with food. It doesn't matter what mm -hmm. time it is. It's not a meal time. I don't care. Like yeah. I will crash out and be the worst version of myself, even if I'd had a blood sugar balancing meal prior to that, which is, mm -hmm. I think, fascinating and also important for people to have the freedom and flexibility to say, like, you can eat your way through this as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and wow, go figure more might be more <laughs> versus less is more, <laughs> which is, I think, really important too. Right. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about your day. Um, I love that you shared your CGM story because that's a, that's a workable example for people at home. What, mm -hmm. what are some of your non-negotiables and your day-to-day -day routine to, to stay balanced? So my morning, I'm pretty hardcore about uh, getting outside early in the day. I have chickens, which is very helpful. I'm all about setting responsibility, which creates healthy ritual, right? And so that's a really good accountability element for me because I have to go down the hill, which is a couple acres away, 
Um, so our chickens are not super close to the home. And so I walked down this country crunchy uh, r- caliche road, granite kind of like crumble and um, watch with the sunrise. I do my little chores, which is just like filling the water, moving their food around, letting them out. Um, I love, there's something for sure in the sound frequency of a rooster crow because I just think it's, I don't know, it, it just kind of lights up my nervous system a little bit. And so I love hearing cocky is what my daughter named our rooster when <laughs> cocky crows. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's lovely. Um, so cocky's a beautiful Easter egg or rooster and we start the day that way. Um, I have my dog outside of the gate. And then if we have time, we'll do a quick lap. Otherwise, I'm running up. And my husband starts the morning routine with Stella. And so then I'm up in the kitchen and we're being present. I'm usually sipping bone broth to start. And then I go collagen in my coffee or tea, depending on the day. Uh, And I have really weaned down my coffee game because I noticed that that jacks up my nervous system for sure. And so I tend to do more coffee or or an espresso choice on a weekend on a more parasympathetic day than a work day. Uh, So like a day like today, I I did bone broth to just tea with collagen for sure. And um, I was doing my boss mode tea, which is a, a black biodynamic tea with lavender and rose. So you still get some calming botanicals to offset, but you get that L-theanine for the brain chemistry. Uh, and that's kind of how I started my day. I went this morning to a dance class. I do a prana shakti movement, which is all about transmuting and liberating stuck energy. Uh, and so today was a fun uh, Galentine's playlist with like LL Cool J and I don't know anything under the sun. Um, so that's fun and move my body in some way, or it might be a yoga class or it might be a hike. And then I start clinic. Um, Well, I always eat then in between. So I usually do a green smoothie on a busy day. So I got that happening today. I do a super greens cube where I take like beet greens, lacinato kale, collards, um, organic spinach, and then broccoli sprouts. And then if I have it, I'll throw E3 Live in also uh, for like some spirulina boost. And just literally pack the blender, blend it and put it in those big like two by two ice cube trays. And then so easy for my weekday smoothies, just pop one of those out. Um, I can share a video link on the Super Greens Cube for everyone. Yes, uh, totally yes. to make these, Ali. I love it. It's so fun. And sometimes I'll throw ginger root in. But then if you don't throw ginger in, you can use it even in a bolognese or you can throw it into bone broth to make a cream of green soup so easy. You just put it with a little blender. Um, and so my little Super Greens Cube with full fat coconut milk, ginger, uh, organic peaches, chia seed, and a scoop of grass fed whey and another scoop of collagen. And then I will eat something solid after two or three patients. Um, so that could be leftover protein from dinner the night before. We have grass-fed brisket today from Super Bowl, which our friends smoked. Uh, and I have that with some pickled vegetable and um, just leftover like stir-fry situation. Uh, and I'll just throw some greens under there. And then my biggest meal is generally, and this doesn't support metabolic research, but again, everything's N equals one. For me in my household, my biggest meal is the dinner meal with my family because I'm the most present. I am in the most parasympathetic space. And that's really where we have conversation at the dinner table. Uh, my Stella is allowed to doodle if she wants, like on paper with pen or crayon. Um, but other than that, we really facilitate a good download of the day at that time. And, and that's where we're getting a solid protein, non-starchy veg, and then maybe a resistant starch like roasted sweet potato or butternut squash or something like that. Oh, that's yeah. kind of the flow. Yes. Well, I, I don't know if this is like you. Um, I do love, I do eat it's like solid food meals. Sometimes I love a smoothie as well. So I'm taking your, your mm-hmm. cube uh, recipe with me today, but I don't like my biggest meal to be lunch because I do find that I feel that post meal depletion. Yes. You know, like, just time for a siesta. Let's take a nap. I like my yes. energy is lower. Like I do, I do, it does take a lot of energy for me to digest a very, very large meal at uh-huh. lunch. Whereas like at dinner, I'm the same, I'm the same as you. Like I'm hanging out with the boys. We're playing in the kitchen, yeah. we're making dinner. But also I'd like to say that like, I'm eating on a toddler schedule. Like my dinner is sometimes between 4.30 and yeah. Yeah. not at eight or nine or 10 o'clock right. at night. So it, no it, I don't feel, I don't feel bad that it's my largest meal of the day. And I do feel like it, it does help me sleep as well. So I think each yeah. day on that one. 
Totally, totally right. And uh, if I am doing a solid meal in the middle of the day, which you know I, I often do as well as the smoothie, I do try to choose though an easier to assimilate protein. So like I could definitely do like a steak and a raw salad at dinner. But during lunch, because your enzymes are actually suppressed, your digestive enzymes to a quarter of that, that they would be in a parasympathetic mode during a sympathetic mode. So if I'm boss mode doing all the things, I know that I'm not, even if I'm taking my digestate enzyme, which I do at the highest stress time, I still will support my body in doing like an easier to break down protein, like a skipjack tuna salad or meatballs, like anything that's ground is like a pre-masticated, you know, things that are easier to break down. So I don't get that gut bomb. (laughs) And then that, yes, residual effect. Oh, I have loved all of your tips all morning, Allie. This has been really so, so, so much fun. I think I'd like to end today because we're both mamas and you've lived taking yourself down this health path and then sharing it with your clients. And I know sharing it with your daughter, Stella. What are your best mom tips for getting her to really embrace food as medicine, Mm -hmm. feel empowered uh, to take care of herself? Oh, I love that. So, I mean, at an early age, I'm a big proponent of baby led weaning and savory starts and helping support our children to stay as savory in their palate as possible. (laughs) And uh, this means that, you know, then they're appreciating the natural sweetness of a banana with almond butter uh, or fresh strawberries or honey crisp apple, et cetera. Um, And so I think that one of the first things that we started to do was prime her palate with things that were very savory and also even astringent or bitter. Uh, and, And this is a really important part just in that toddler phase shift, because if you can prime them that way, it's going to make things a lot easier going forward. Uh, We very early on also started talking about no naked carbs and uh, what a carb food was. In fact, our snack bins, we kind of color coded. uh, So we were very kind of Montessori mind space of her having autonomy and accessibility and, you know, so like the cups she could reach for her water and she'd go fill it up from the glass jug and et cetera. And so early age, you know, two and a half, to four and a half world was all about, okay, you chose a carb. What protein or fat would you like? These are three protein choices. Here's two fat choices. Pistachios. Okay. That's a healthy fat. You can have the pistachios with the grapes. Uh, And so just starting to kind of create that matrix like thought process of the pairing and combining, I think is really key. And also a lot of just real talk. I believe that we should educate our children, not speak down to them, but help them want to strive to live up. Uh, And so we talk about things like blood sugar balance and dysglycemia. And when we have a blood sugar spike, maybe at a birthday party, because we chose the cake or whatnot, um, what does that feel like? Because if she'll say, oh, my belly hurts because it's not to shame, it's but it's to have a conversation about it. Okay, well, maybe next time we, we make sure that we first have this. Or, um, okay, well, remember what happened that last time when you went to grandma's and you said that you, you were feeling a little angry? What do you think caused that? Or what do you think was different there than how we do things here? Um, and so I think really allowing guided conversations and allowing them to have these aha realizations. Uh, but again, allowing that autonomy of choice that's guided in the what category, not what do you want for dinner, because that's setting ourselves up to fail. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, we are making paleo chicken tenders tonight. Um, What vegetable would you like? Let's go open the drawer and see what we have as options. And then, you know, letting them use the kids' knives and interact and and be an active component of the meal preparation is huge. And uh, we're big proponents of you eat all of your protein until you get seconds of anything. Uh, And I think that that's all really important and good. And what I get concerned about as a mom in this era is the whole, uh, I would call it disempowerment movement, unfortunately, of all foods fit and we want to normalize junk food. And um, we're not, now we're not calling it junk food. We're calling it ultra processed food, which feels a little bit more neutral. Um, And, and I very early with Stells with the frozen gummies and the, you know, Paw Patrol, whatever it was at the time, we would look at the container and we would literally read the ingredients. 
And, you know, before she could read, I would read them out loud and I would say, what does that look like? What is, what does propylene glycol look like? I don't know. That sounds like a chemical. I don't think that that's grown in, I don't think that's a whole real food. Um, should we put that in our body? I, mom thinks that we should put whole real foods in our body. Um, and so, you know, we would talk about how if you see something marketed to you, that's probably the industry trying to trick you. Um, and, and I'm, I'm fine with that talk because I think that that's real talk. And, you know, I know that there's going to be some hater out there that says that that's so stringent, whatnot. But I believe that the investment in my child's metabolic health is going to help her for decades to come and that we will buy the Ziploc bag with the frozen characters on it and put our own trail mix in there. And she can have a figurine to put in her lunch if she needs, but she doesn't need to treat her body like a garbage can because of culture. Um, and so we're pretty, we're pretty tight on it in our household and we're, we're always bringing it back to, is this a whole real food? Oh, it's so refreshing for me to hear you say this because what I see in practice, which is I'm sure what you see in practice is that now we don't want to label anything. And when we don't label anything, we're not educating, but the problem comes with Maybe like I can think of a client right now who does not know how to roast vegetables for her family. She doesn't know how to put a chicken in the oven. Scrambled eggs is where we're at and that is okay, but doesn't want to label food for her child. But unfortunately, the only foods being brought in for the child are in packages. And I think the best way that you can learn is to learn with your child. So how can we learn how to roast veggies? How can we learn how to throw chicken in a slow cooker and shred it with a fork? Like you do not need to be Martha Stewart, but you need to be able to say, this is a protein. This is a fat. This is a vegetable. This is a fruit. This is a processed carbohydrate. This is a whole food carbohydrate and have that knowledge because what happens is this child doesn't have the education And they're going to grow up and maybe the world is going to tell them that, or they're going to feel like who they are or their body isn't the way they want it to be. And then they're going to go to something like TikTok, or they're Mm -hmm. going to go to Pinterest or the internet and look up like quick fix diet, quick fix help. Yes. Problem is, is that's, that's never laying the foundation for them being able to really take care of their own body. And it is disempowering. It is Mm -hmm. so frustrating because name one other thing in the world other than food and diet culture where we're not, we're not wanting for our children to know more, to learn more, to feel like they can stand on their own two feet and have an opinion about what makes them feel good or what they want in their life. And in this space, Mm -hmm. we're like, Ooh, don't label it. Don't say anything bad about it. And it's like, you can empower and educate without, without shame and shame around food. It's like, I'm making a choice to eat this. And then I'm making the choice to take care of myself in this other way. Like, Oh, I get heated. I get heated. I know. (laughs) I know. And it's, it's, it is, it's, it's, it shouldn't come with emotion of, you don't have to call it good, bad. You can point blank, call it a processed food product not a whole real food because that's what it is. Yeah. And so it's the idea that, well, while we eat whole real foods in our household, we believe that food is medicine and that's an important element to how we nourish in this household. And absolutely, Stella, when you are 18, you can make your own choices on that, <laughs> but I'm pretty confident. And I've seen even her apply when, when I give her the autonomy of choice at a birthday party, because we don't do any dyes, any gluten, any, anything. Um, and so if a mom makes a gluten-free cake or buys a gluten-free thing for her, because this happens all the time, <laughs> then it's like, she's right now at that age, almost eight, where it's like that, well, and I have a crush on this boy and he got me the gluten-free brownie mom. I was like, well, that's a big, that's an emotional thing. And so there is the option to have a courtesy bite. There is the option to say no, thank you. And there is the option to eat it and see what your body does. There are all of those options. (laughs) And you know, that, that, that is, we will read and, and we'll see if that boy even paid attention if you ate the brownie or did he go back into the leaps and bounds Hit and you should go chase him and throw balls at him. I don't know. You know, it's like because we know that we tend to perceive always, right? That like piece of, of because food is cer- it is ceremonial and it is celebratory and it should come with joy. There is emotion connected to nourishment. Um, and we want to create healthy relationships with that, but we also don't want to do that at the cost of our own wellness. And so there's 
some understanding of what barrier lies there. And I think that that's something that will just continue to develop in our conversations. Right. I I think the kids are really curious too. They want to know, like Mm -hmm. my three-year-old now is like, and this is maybe TMI, but like they, like, I know the difference when I'm wiping a three-year-old, like, and I look at the toilet, does he have a well-formed bowel movement or is it sloppy? In Calvary, right? You know, mm-hmm. like it if it is loose or it is small milk duds, I'm going. Mm-hmm. He's constipated, or he's not having enough fiber rich foods, or he there's something in his diet, maybe like too much sugar or processed mm-hmm. flours, and we're create we're getting this like outcome. I talk to him about that. I'm like, look, you got it. Like I, we joke that it's called a no wipe, but it's like uh-huh. it had a really good you know, Bristol stool chart, banana style poop, there's not much left over. And I'm like, it's a no wipe, bud. I mean, I'm going to give you a courtesy wipe, but like, this this is how we know, like Mm -hmm. I'm educating them. And then he goes, what foods make a no wipe mom? And so we're like at the table, fiber rich foods, like that broccoli on your plate, or, you know, those roasted carrots, like we are talking about all the good and all the silver lining and all the positive yes. things. And ha- he is noticing the difference. Is it easy to have a bowel movement? Does my tummy hurt? Do I feel energized? What makes mm-hmm. big muscles? Like they want, my boys want to know that stuff. And I think I love that. we empower our children to mm-hmm. retain that information because beyond that, it's like they're, they're not going to be able to show up in their life the way they want to. Right. And when we want them to be taste adventures, another thing that we do and and I've talked about in clinic is exploring the why behind it. Like every human, including children, of course, want to be heard and seen. And they want specialized attention to understand what their wants and desires are. And so if they don't like, for Stella, for instance, it was cooked bell peppers. So we had to have this long, and we have this worksheet um, in a program I have, um, and it's called a Taste Adventures Worksheet. And so it's like, what's the food? What In what style did I try it? So it's like chopped up raw or sauteed in olive oil with garlic or in a quesadilla, siete quesadilla, where I couldn't pull them out. Um, and so, you know, you can play with different delivery, but the conversation we had was exactly, she said, oh, that's gross. And this was like at age four. And, and so she ended up being able to tell me that she felt like they were like worms. And I was like, fair enough. They kind of are kind of slimy. (laughs) Like, you know, like I didn't, I didn't have that vision in my head, but I see that. So if they were cut in smaller pieces, would they be like worms? No, smaller pieces would be fine. Well, all of a sudden now we can eat bell peppers as a family. (laughs) Whereas before she was picking them out and saying, Um, and and so it's, it's literally sometimes just coming down to their level and, and understanding why. And we don't say just yuck words. We have to use descriptive terms. Was it too crunchy? Was it too soggy? Was it too spicy? Was it part of the flavor or the texture? Let's start there. You know, and you kind of just like a taste detective as they're the taste adventurer have to work with them and then get them to be willing to try it in different ways so that they have that open-mindedness to explore whole real foods. And I think that that helps because so many mamas listening, the most frustrating thing is when you spend a lot of money on, you know, an, at a natural grocery store and you make this perfect paleo meal and then you get rejection from it and you feel like, screw it, this isn't even worth it. Uh, and so I think when we come down to our children and communicate with them about what the dislikes are and whys, that that really helps with the willingness. 110%, 110%. And then like you said, like kids' knives, I mean, the biggest thing for me has just been like the, the kitchen tower. I have two. Yeah, of them, I love I, the leaning tower, the- yes. You know, they're just like, they're up there. They have their kitchen knives. They like chop and cut. And the other day I I look over at Toshin and he's putting like a raw spinach leaf in his mouth. And he is uh-huh. um, without labeling him, like baby, the kid who is not as much of an adventurer, but it's sure. like when I'm not looking and he's playing, it yeah. happens. And so yeah. it was like, what Popeye, what are you doing? You know, it's just like, it's, it's, it can be fun and it doesn't have to be heavy when they, when they have the opportunity to be, like you said, an adventure. And I love that tip about getting those descriptor words. You can't say, yeah, that is so many gold right. nuggets today. I'm taking oh, love it. Good, good, good. 
Thank Good. you. The mama who's come before me with all of it. <laughs> we'll see. All of it. Talk we'll to see. me when she's a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you back on the podcast then. Yes. <laughs> That's how, this is how I learn, you know, I'm like <laughs> taking it. it taking that one home with me. <laughs> it's yes. good stuff. Okay. Allie, you are just such a breath of fresh air. I love that you stand in your conviction and, um, and really walk the walk and, and show your community and your family how to live their best life. Thank you for being here on the podcast, for doing the work that you do. The anti-anxiety diet and cookbook are out. You have a practice, you have a supplement line, you share online. We're going to put all those links in the show notes, but where can people follow along if they're if they've got their phone next to them right sure. now. So it's at Ali Miller RD. So just A-L-I-M-I-L-L-E-R-R-D. And that's my social handles just on Instagram and Facebook. And then AllieMillerRD.com is the website. And that's where we have our protocols, my naturally nourished supplement line, which has the GABA Calm and the Calm and Clear I discussed today and uh, has books and programs and a uh, link to my clinic, which is more of the one-on-one deep functional medicine work. And uh, later this fall, we hope to release my fourth book, Naturally Nourished Kids, which really unpacks a lot of what we've been discussing at the end of this episode. So that's something fun for people to watch for. I love it. I'll be, I'll be getting my hands on that one too. Thank you Very for cool. all of you, Allie, and thanks for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you.